All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the broadcast. It is Monday, April the 23rd, 2018. Thank you very much for being with me here for another edition of the broadcast. I've got a lot of different things to discuss with you here on the show today, so we'll be getting into all that. Various news items to discuss with you here as well. Today, a whole bevy of stuff, so get ready, and uh, again, glad you're with us. Hope you had a nice weekend. Uh, actually, you know, right out of the gates, pretty much, that's what I want to talk about here. And then we'll get into some news and various other things. We had a couple of significant days over the weekend, so I'd like to give you my take on those and discuss that here with you in just a minute. Uh, I've continued to, uh, you know, do less shows and concentrate solely on working on uh, Spellcasters Volume 2, my newest film. And, uh, you know, I always set these goals, man, and, and my goal was to have it by, done by this time of the month, but uh, this month, but I mean, you know, I, I do what I can. I got I, I to gotta set these goals. I can't just say, you know, you can't just work on something like this and not have some kind of a goal. Otherwise, you'll just, you'll never, you know, you'll never end. So I always, you know, set these goals as realistic as I possibly can, but Inevitably, what happens? Like, you know, once you start, you know, once you start working, then you see how much work you've got to do, really. And uh, this is the first film I've ever done where you know, it's it's crazy because I, I I mean I, I, you know I'd love to have other people working on these things, but the way these films are, they they exist so they exist so solely just in my mind because I've done all the research. It's hard to like it would be difficult to you know exact orders to people and whatnot but you know man as i've talked about i'm just not going to worry about that anymore i'm just going to keep in all honesty i probably got about you know three maybe three or four weeks left of work maybe but uh again you just never know but i'm chugging along and uh, as I've you know as I've stated, uh, there's there's no question in my mind that you guys are going to love this film. Uh, every time, as I've talked about, every time I do, you know, because I I rush so many films out, the first two or three films I made, I just rushed them out, and you could tell. And then you know I stopped doing that, and my, as I've stopped doing that, and I've taken my time to make sure they're right before they're done and out, you know, the 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 results have really shown. So I'm really, I'm really glad about that. But man, I, I, I'm, I'm really, there's, there's just, it's just a bevy of, of info. I might end up doing two cuts of this thing. I don't know. Might end up doing a regular cut and then an extended cut. I mean, the regular cut is already an extended cut. That's a fucked up thing. <laughs> the regular cut is already going to be two fucking full movies. I'm talking about that and some addition, in addition, and some more in addition to it for an extended cut. I'm not talking about cutting off what's already there. I'm talking about a, a retarded amount of information is what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, again, it's just, it's one of the most frustrating things, not, not really for me so much, but for, to make people understand is, you know, you, there's no way possible to get everything in a movie. But every time I make a movie, oh, hey, what about this? Yeah, I know about that, but, you know, you can't put everything in there. There's no way in fuck, man. Okay, it, it would take it would take a 12-disc series. I could do a 12-disc fucking series on nothing but this subject, the, the m m of musical conspiracies. But it's bigger than that, you know, just like Spellcasters 1. Yeah, it's about Hollywood and mind control, but, it, you know, if you watch it, it's, it's way more than that. And so is this, but it, it, it connects 100% already in with everything else we've already discussed. But there's all kinds of interesting things about the inner workings of the music industry and stuff that people just flat just don't know that's going to be in this film. And, and uh, it's just wild, the stuff that I've come across. 
uh, just like you know we talked about with Hollywood, and just like I exposed in the other Spellcasters films with the CIA connections and the you know connections back to MK Ultra stuff and all that. I mean, you think there's CIA con- connections in Hollywood? Let me tell you, you know, the CIA connections run rampant in in the music industry too, and and, and really they're one, they're kind of one and the same thing, but not but not at the same time because. Hollywood is more confined to that one, you know, the one area of Los Angeles or whatever, where all the, the movie studio, studios and whatever, and the music industry is not, um, you know, yes, it's a huge part in that area too, but it's not nailed down to one part of the world, you know. So, <coughs> with with the music industry, it's a much more far-reaching thing than just Hollywood and, and stuff like we discussed in Volume 1. You understand what I mean? Whereas you're talking about something with Hollywood where that's, okay, again, that's a localized thing, right? Well, this musical conspiracy thing that we're talking about, is it confined to one area, one country? We're talking about, you know, the United States. We're talking about the UK. Primarily, I guess that would be the main two. But what I mean is, because of that, you have a whole bunch of more players involved. Yes, of course, the CIA always plays a role in that too, but you've got, you know, you've got the involvement of British intelligence. You've got, you know, Israeli Mossad. And you've got, I mean, it's, it's incredible, man, how many seriously, it really when I start when I started re- really finding out all this stuff, a lot of these, you know how you, you, you believe me I, I see these people too even though I'm into this stuff, I still think there are people out there. People say this about me, you know, that I think everything's a conspiracy. Well, there are people out there that really fucking think everything's a conspiracy, and many things they think this is a conspiracy about there isn't, and uh, you know that's that's the problem and trying to make people understand this stuff is because the more you research, the more you find out, it's no joke. And that's what, and again, that's, that's why they've gotten away with this stuff because your average person is not going to believe that everything's a conspiracy, right? So if you just do these things over and over and over and over and over again, it's a perfect way to get caught, to never get caught because your average person in the right mind is not going to believe just about everything's a conspiracy, even if they're presented with evidence of it. And that about brings us up to date, ladies and gentlemen, as far as, <laughs> I'm not kidding you, man. It's it, it, a, a person with a less uh, grounded personality or whatever you want to call it, like ground, less grounded ego, I don't know. A person with a less grounded constitution than I would absolutely go ape shit, bat shit, crazy, nuts if they were presented with the research the way I'm... That's why you're lucky you're getting this stuff in the in the context of a film and it's, you know, it's made to be digested and stuff. The way I'm getting it with just the raw data, dude, it I mean, it, it's almost harrowing to even want to discuss and put out there because it's not my fault that as I've researched, the facts have presented themselves to me that, my God, man, so many of these famous musician deaths through decades, folks, have all been conspiracies. Almost to the point where it's hard to find one that hasn't been. And that's not my fault, but what it does is, when I present that evidence, it automatically is going to make, you know, someone assume that I think everything's a conspiracy, and it's not that I think everything is a conspiracy. Anybody that knows me and and knows my work knows that, you know, I'm always quick to point out the things that are bullshit, and I never jump on these, you know, horse shit, things that everybody else jumps all over and then I end up taking the fucking grief for being the one, the only person that doesn't go along with the plan. And then of course, it, you know, it may take a couple of years, but it always turns out it was right. I didn't go, get on board 
with the no planes thing, even though I think there is some evidence to support that, but I didn't ever get on board with that because it's a fucking, it's a honeypot. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's just like flat earth or any of this other stuff. Does it matter if I, even if I thought it was possible, I'm not getting on board with it because I see the psyop for what it is. You know, that's, that's the whole thing. You know, I don't, I, I've never jumped in on these things. You know, all the Nibiru fear mongering stuff. You know, all this stuff that people jump on these fucking bandwagons about. The Alex Jones being fucking Bill Hicks thing, which is absolutely retarded. But then you don't get on board with it and people want to give you shit about it. You know. But, uh, boy, I tell you what. It's, it, it's wild. There's, I mean, you start looking and you start going, I mean, my God, has there been any of these? I, I mean, the Randy Rhodes, that's a great example. If you don't know who Randy Rhodes, most people, I think, know who Randy Rhodes was, but if you don't know who he was, he was a famous uh, guitar player with Ozzy Osbourne that uh, supposedly died in this, in this plane crash and all this stuff. Well, man. Whew. The stuff I've uncovered with that. Unbelievable. And it all ties in, and that's that's going to be the other thing that I'm weaving through this, is weaving through the whole, not just the, the suspicious deaths and the deaths that weren't what we've told they were, but also weaving it together back through with the CIA stuff, uh, specifically with CIA drug smuggling, and connecting that with certain musicians and certain groups, and... I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. And then I can also, I, I can't even talk anymore about it. My God. But that's something that, that, that and I don't want to give too much away because it's going to be a, 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 a kind of a focal point in the, in the film, but just kind of as a little sneak preview here. That's, it's well known, you know, amongst pretty much everybody in the world. You know, the the whole... Musician thing, be it rock stars, be it country stars, pop stars, whatever. Hell, even fucking go, you can go back farther than that to the old, you know, back to the old days and go back to the crooners and fucking, you know, guys, the rat pack and stuff. Those guys were doing fucking drugs and taking pills and shit too. But everybody knows that, you know, drugs and musicians and the whole thing is, is, is synonymous. And so, that's why these are easy covers whenever they want to bump one of these guys off or make it look like a suicide. They want to steal their publishing, whatever else, whatever other reasons they have. And, you know, it's just become a part of the accepted culture. You know, rock stars and drugs, and then that's perpetuated by the shows like, you know, behind the music and stuff, where that's all they focus on. But the one thing nobody ever talks about, nobody ever discusses, is that, you know, where, where are these drugs coming from? Because the way they, they try to make us believe it happens is that, you know, somebody's a nobody or whatever, struggling musician, right? Then they become rich and famous, and all of a sudden, you know, the day they have a, they, that they recorded a, their record, or the day it's on sale, which, of course, you know, people don't know it even takes years. It takes years to start getting royalties. That, that, that's one thing. You know, fucking, uh, well, straight up, Randy Rose was murdered. He didn't die in that plane crash by an accident. Even the chief a FAA investigator on the scene said this was no accident. It had to do with some of this cocaine stuff. He never, he never saw a dime. He, all that money he played on those first two records. I mean, he probably had the shortest, most influential career of any guitarist ever. And they tried to fuck everybody else who played on those first two Aussie records out of the money too. Lee Kerslink, Bob Daisley, those guys are still in court fighting to get money that Sharon Osbourne fucked them out of. Her. She even resorted to, to having those albums re-recorded at, at one point and having their bass and drums taken out and having uh, the drummer from Fate No More and... Uh, uh, Trujillo, who plays with Metallica now, 
replace the original base part so she didn't have to pay the people. So, yeah, Sharon Osbourne is, is part of this. She's getting exposed. Her fucking father, man, who they called the Al Capone of rock. I mean, I'll be showing you how all this stuff weaves and ties in together with drugs and the mob and the CIA and these deaths made to look like uh, accidents and whatnot. And oftentimes, it's just to rob people, really, so other people can get rich. But there's also bigger things to it than that. But most people, they, I, they just, I guess they just have this belief that when somebody becomes rich and famous and makes a record or whatever, automatically they just go to the same guy, I guess, they, you know, they were buying dime bags from when they were nobodies or whatever, and have a bunch of money and say, oh, okay, great, now I have a bunch of money, I want a bunch of drugs. I mean, why is it that musicians and whatnot have such easy access to these, to these drugs? People have never really questioned that. Why has it always been, well, because the CIA for many years ha, uh, has been using uh, concerts and, and, and tours as a front to sell and distribute narcotics all over the globe. It's been going on for decades, and why it's never been busted, never been talked about, never been exposed, never been shown to be a thing has solely to do with the fact that it's a top-down operation. It's CIA head, just like all the rest of these things. Now, people have seen a little scant glimpses and scant, scant evidence of this. But it's one of the main things I'm going to be weaving together with so many of these cases. Because oftentimes it appears that the in some cases, the artists are aware fully it's going on, and in some cases, they aren't aware. And it appears that some of these artists, once they figure out what's going on, because a lot of times what happens is, this has happened so many times, you'll, you know, you've seen these, how many bands can you name where you, you know, how many artists can you name where they have the same old fucking story you've heard a million times? Band comes up from nothing, gets famous. Super mega famous, gets into drugs. Downfall. Rebirth, you know, rinse, recycle, repeat. But see, what happens is when these guys, a lot of times when these guys come out of the fog... Because when they're at their, at their peak and these guys are at their drug and highest, that's when the biggest amount of business is going on and it's the easiest to get away with it. These guys are, I mean, it's, it's been going on for decades and it still goes on to this day. Um, but oftentimes it appears that these, some of these individuals find out, you know, they, they find out what's up. They don't like it, and then that's why you have some of these sort of abrupt breakups of bands, and then you have, you know, you get told once, well, you know, musical differences, or this, this, that, or the other, this person doesn't want to tour anymore, or whatever. And then the years go by, and the stories start to change. The narratives of why they broke up change and the reasons, you start to see that start to happen. And then you have these bands that break up for a while and they get back together or, you know, 15 farewell, farewell tours and the rest of this stuff. That's not just musicians being indecisive. I mean, look how many of these guys that we're talking about that have done this that didn't need the money. But yet they're still on the road year in and year out. I mean, the Rolling Stones, Kiss, I mean, a fucking uh, band like REO Speedwagon. REO Speedwagon has been on the road every single year. They have had some form of that band on the road every single year since 1973. ZZ Top. They're going on, I think ZZ Top's 50 year anniversary is next year. These guys, a lot of these guys at this point, they don't need the money. 
It's not even about that. It's because the machinery and the the thing has become bigger than the music and the band itself in ways that your average person can't even see. And most of the time, it's because of these illicit activities that the tours and the bands and the acts become the front for, whether they know it or not. So, again, this is, the, you know, people want to know why these musicians are bumped off. Well, this is, again, this is why I'm making this film. This is what I'm going to show you. I haven't even given you a tenth of what the content of this film, what I've talked about to you about today, not even close. So there's so much more to this than most people know, and there's so much more to this than the average fucking whoever researcher on YouTube. Man, you know, you got a lot of people talking about these things. But my work on it is going to be the game changer, and it's going to become the model that other people are going to model their work after. Mark my words. Okay? All there is to that. Man, oh, man. So, yeah, um, like I said, I've just been, uh, you know, I've been on fire. I've been trying. But the problem, you know, as I've talked about, the problem again and again is that I, you know, take time off to work on these films and I'm not able to do less shows and then we just don't get flat any support or, you know, financial contributions or anything at all while I'm working on that. So I'm trying to come up with a new plan for this. Um, instead of just doing one, just doing one or doing the other, I think I'm going to like start doing i don't know i don't know how often or what the frequency will be on this but i think i'm just going to start doing like you know okay i work for the film on for two weeks and then for two weeks i'll do radio shows and then at the end of that i'll work on the film for another two weeks so i think i'm just going to start alternating it out uh so i can try to have a balance between still having shows and and us being able to get the support that we need and whatnot to continue here while i'm i'm not doing this you know while i'm working on this film because honestly I mean, I really just need to not do any shows for like a month at all and do nothing but work on this film. But I can't do that because, again, then we don't get support. People think when, I, when I'm working on the film, people just think they come up with the assumption that I'm just doing nothing. They think I'm just sticking my thumb up my ass and sitting on my ass and doing nothing. If you don't hear from me on the fucking radio show, ladies and gentlemen, that means that I am doing other business concerning this work that has to require my absolute laser focus to have it done. So when you don't hear from me for, you know, a week or something on the shows, that's not a bad thing. And in fact, it should be, you shouldn't take it as, I mean, people, everybody just takes it as, oh, well, he's either, he's just abandoning us or he's not doing any work at all right now. So I might as well not give me any support. No, that's when you should be supporting me the most. When you don't hear from me for a while on this show, folks, that means that I can't get away from whatever else I'm doing to come and do a show right now. And that means I need your support. Double the amount I would if you were just hearing me doing radio shows every day. <laughs> I, I, I've never been able to formulate that into words and tell people, but that's the fucking honest truth, man. I'm so glad I was actually finally able to formulate that into words and put that together for you today. I feel like I accomplished something because it's something I've been trying to express to people for a while. When you don't hear from me for like a week or something, that doesn't mean I need less of your support. It means I need more of it because I'm so tied down. That's what's been going on. And look, I love doing this show, man. And I've tried to, you know, have a balance and do shows and still work on the film. But man, this thing is just too important. I, <laughs> and I, I'm ready to have it done and get it done. But again, just, you know, we still, you know, we went to the, and I understand, man, I'm not doing a lot of shows, so there aren't going to be people, as many people getting memberships now. As soon as I'm back doing radio shows, we'll, get, we'll have more. But, you know, we switched to the membership thing. We had thousands and thousands of people listen every week, and we still only had about 12 people get fucking memberships, and most of those are people that already had them in the past. I, I saw maybe two or three people, like, like I said, that were newbies. But um, it's just fucking tough, man. It really is. Um. Because I just don't have time right now to do fundraising shit. I just don't. But if I don't do it, you know, that we don't get anything in. It's it's a it, God. I can't tell you how frustrating it is because this film, man. I'm telling you what, 
It's a fucking game changer. And the fact that I've had to, I mean, God, I, we've gotten like a, seriously, this movie's made on the, the shoestring of a shoestring. A couple of scant, couple of hundred bucks here and there is what we've had to work on, you know. But I guess, I don't know. Again, that's why I've, I've, uh, that's why I've contemplated not making any more films after this. Because I just can't keep doing this thing every time I make a film where, you know, I have to do less shows and then get less support. And then it just, you know, it just causes this out of control spiral to happen. And I need trying to find some way to not make that happen anymore, you know. And of course, if you know, if we, if we could get whatever budgets that we had that we needed, it wouldn't be a problem. Oh, so I don't know. I I, I don't I really I don't know what the solution is. But all I know is is that it you know the more the more time and more ability I have to put all my energy and focus all my energy on this film, the the, the better it's going to be, and it's going to be fucking great. It really is. I'm 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 just I'm just excited about it, but you know, I, again, at the same time, I've got to be. It's like ee, putting on the fucking brakes on, you know, on a Lambo at 130 miles an hour, man. And then you know we got to downshift into this whole other mindset. It's a completely different mindset talking like I am to you now, and doing this radio show. It's completely different. Because really, when I'm making a film, it's multitasking five thousand. I mean, it's you know, ah. It's fucking crazy. But anyway, I'm going to try to find, figure out some kind of a thing. Uh, and I'm also, I'm, I've got other ideas and plans and shit I'm, I'm cooking up. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to talk about them yet, but. I, I just, I get emails from people all the time about the way, I, you know, people like, oh, the, you know, I wish you still did the show with the shoutcast stream and all that and i've talked about that you know a bunch of times and, and like i said though i don't do any different show than i do now i guess it's just people you know miss listening to it with absolute live purity or whatever I, you know i don't know it's it it's not any different i really don't do it any differently live than i do it as if i'm recording it you know it's it's the same exact um delivery but at the same time, there's, you know, there's, there's big, uh, big vast vacuums out there. I don't know. I guess I'm just sick. I guess I just need to lay it all, just lay it out. I didn't, I debate. I didn't really want to talk about this right now, but I guess I will. Cause I'm already fucking saying it, but, um, there's, I'm just, and I know a lot of you are too. And that's the only reason I'm talking about this. I'm just sick to death of the entire, whatever you want to call it, radio landscape for the type of work that I discuss that's real and not fucking psychological operation horse shit or, you know, designed to serve a left or right political party or whatever else. I'm just sick to death of the radio airwaves as far as, you know, whatever you want to call this, conspiracy or research or alternative media or whatever. I'm sick to death of that landscape being littered by nothing but fucking CIA-controlled clowns. I'm sick of it, man. I'm looking at you coast-to-coast coast AM. I'm looking at you, Alex Jones. I'm fucking sick of this shit. With seemingly nobody with the cojones enough to step up to the fucking plate and take these guys on. I did it once. I couldn't sustain it. But I mean, when I first started doing, you know, I never want, I've talked about this before. I, I never wanted to do a radio show. I never wanted, I, it was, wasn't my idea in the first place. Someone suggested I, I do it because of how much research I had done. And when someone suggested it to me, it was like a fucking light switch going off. And, I, and even at that time, I was, you know, still a fan of Alex Jones and whatnot. But I said right then and there, I said, you know what? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It was like a light switch. Went, yeah, I can't believe I never thought of that. I am going to do a radio show. And you know what else? In a year, 
I'm going to be taking on Alex Jones in his own time slot. Now, I don't know what possessed me to say that. Because I usually, it's not usually an egotistical, hubris type thing that ever would be uttered out of my mouth. I don't know why. I really don't. <coughs> but I said it, and guess what? I did it in nine months. In nine months, I was going up against that motherfucker at 11 o'clock every day. I was doing a four-hour show in his exact time slot every day. I got put on some of his FM channels. It got taken away from one specifically, a big 50,000-watt flamethrower in Central Texas. That enchilada eating bastard had to fucking, they had to go in. This is, oh, I'm so proud of this. Let me tell you. Because they would, I, I, I heard this. I mean, I heard his show on this going down to Austin a few times back in the 2000s to go to concerts and stuff. And you would hear, you'd get like an hour of Alex Jones, or like two hours of Alex Jones or an hour or something. Then they, for an hour, they would preempt him and play polka. They have this polka show on this fucking network that's been on this radio network for like 50 or 60 years, literally. It's huge down there. And then they would come back and play the final two hours or whatever of the show. So the, the owner got sick of Jones and his shit, and he heard my show and liked it. So he decided to put me and put my show every day on, on Jones's time slot. Man, Jesus. And I made the fucking... Still, to me, it's the most legendary thing I've ever done, and I don't think I'll ever be able to top this. Because, man, I was nailing it with... I was getting up there 11 o'clock, you know, in the middle of the day, dude. This is broadcasting across a huge part of Central Texas, damn near to all, like, it, it, you can start picking it up about an hour or so out of Dallas, and you, and you, you know, you can catch it about all the way to Austin, and everywhere in between. Boy, I was getting up talking about the Anunnaki, I was getting up there talking about fucking the CMP, and the Jesuits, and Freemasons, and Illuminati, I mean, they just weren't fucking ready for me, and bringing up the fact that, you know, Ron Paul had fucking connections to the Council for National Policy talking about that. And, you know, that whole audience was like full of, uh, of uh, Ron Paul lovers and stuff. But it got so bad and it started to, to hurt Jones's fucking organization so bad that I got a call from the owner one day and he said, Josh, man, I'm sorry. I have to do this to you. He said, I love you. I love your show. He's like, but Alex Jones walked in here today with a suitcase full, full of cash, $30,000 in cash. And our network is struggling, we need, and we need the cash, and he do it. And he paid me $30,000 to put his show back on in place of yours, and I had no choice. I had to do it. And I understood. You know, I understood. But, boy, for about six months, them motherfuckers got the straight-up Reeves raw deal, dude, for like three hours a fucking day, Monday through Friday. It was legit. They'll never let that happen again. Nobody will ever put me on an FCC licensed 50,000 watt fucking flamethrower antenna and let me in the middle of the day, folks. And I'm talking about like coast to coast AM, you know, what people would consider like coast to coast AM level shit that should only be heard at, you know, at three o'clock in the morning when everybody's asleep. I was blasting that shit out across the fucking Texas airwaves, dude, for like a good six months. And that fucking enchilada eating bastard had to pay $30,000 out of his own money to take me off. Now, I'm sorry. As far as the kick in the nads to Alex Jones goes, out there, uh, truthers and so-called people on YouTube, uh, thank you very much. I don't think very many of you can really compete with that. That's a kick in that fucker's nads right there. Let me tell you. 